Lecture 36 The Places of Myth Sacred Trees In our last two lectures, we have been talking about sacred places and the parts that they play in the myths of the world. We've talked about rocks and lakes and mountains, and most of them are physical entities we can actually visit. This time we'll take a look at something a little bit more abstract, um, the cosmic tree, uh, many of which we can't visit per se because we're, we happen to be living in the middle of it already. Although our very last example uh, in this lecture will we'll find a tree that's a little more imminent, one that we could actually go visit. Cosmic trees occur in all kinds of mythologies. The most famous one, perhaps, is Yggdrasil in Norse myth, which we looked at back in Lecture 12, but they occur in lots of other cultures, too. They're especially prominent in Southeast Asia and the Mongolian parts of Central Asia. The idea of a cosmic tree is that it is a giant tree which connects all three worlds, the underworld, the earth where we live, and the heaven. And, and the tree allows commerce and traffic back and forth among these three worlds. Sometimes the, the tree is thought of as a ladder or a rope or a chain, but the tree is better both because it's living and because the tree's roots can reach deep down into the earth in a way that's not quite true of ladders or chains or ropes. In cultures where uh, shamans are important, Shamans frequently use the cosmic tree in their trances as they travel from one world to the other. And a pole made from a tree is very often the symbol of the shaman himself. How important trees are, um, we can see in one of Mercia Eliad's books, Patterns in Comparative Religion. He devotes 65 pages of that book to a chapter called Vegetation, Rites and Symbols of Regeneration. And much of that space is devoted to cosmic trees. For Eliad, a cosmic tree is, a axis, is an axis mundi in a very clear symbolic way since it connects the upper and the lower worlds with the middle world of humans and allows energy from both of those other worlds to flow to us. This is really clear in myths in which the cosmic tree is actually planted right in the Earth's navel. The roots reach down to the netherworld, the branches reach the pole star, the stars and the moon are in the top branches, which is sometimes where the souls of unborn children live, too. The Arapaho people in Wyoming have a myth showing how a cosmic tree works. This isn't, in this story, this isn't precisely a cosmic tree, but we can use it to see how a cosmic tree works. A woman sees a porcupine and wants its quills, and so she starts chasing the porcupine. The porcupine starts climbing a tree, and she follows it up the tree. As she climbs and gets closer, the tree keeps getting taller and taller and taller, so the porcupine is always about the same distance ahead of her. By the time she looks down, she realizes she is so far off the ground that she's afraid to go back, and so she has to keep going. Eventually, the top of the tree pierces the clouds, and then she and the porcupine both get off onto another world that's up there. And there she stays for a long while as a porcupine's wife. Uh, she gets back to Earth, she wants to go back to Earth, and she eventually finds her way back in a very ingenious way. Um, every night after dinner, she saves the tendons from the buffalo and then ties them together one by one, piece by piece, until she has one that's long enough to reach from heaven down to Earth. Um, and then she digs a hole in the, in the bottom of the sky world, um, deep enough so that she can pierce through it and she can actually see the, the Earth down below. And then she puts her digging stick, lays it across that hole, ties her makeshift rope to that, which can reach down to earth, and she lets herself down. Her story goes on from there, but we, we can see how a, how a cosmic tree is conceived and how it allows communication from one world to the next. The Cheyenne have, have another story. Again, this is not precisely a story of a cosmic tree, but it shows how it works. Um, there's a girl who has seven brothers, and she is the world's greatest quill worker. She makes the most beautiful white buckskin clothing. The Buffalo Nation keeps sending representatives to this family, each buffalo being larger and more fierce than the last one, and each one demanding in turn that the brothers turn the maiden over to them. They keep refusing, but the last ambassador from the Buffalo Nation is the largest buffalo anyone has ever seen. 
the seven brothers and the, and the girls start climbing a tree to get away from the buffalo. While the buffalo, seeing what's happened, starts running and knocking his head against the tree, trying to knock the tree down. The youngest brother keeps shooting an arrows up into the top of the tree, and each time an arrow hits the top of the tree, it grows another thousand feet higher. Just as the tree falls, it's finally been knocked down by this enormous buffalo down below. Just as the tree falls down, they step off the tree into the sky. Their path of retreat is gone, so what, they, what do they do now? The youngest brother solves the problem by um, turning all of the whole family into stars, the stars which make up the Big Dipper. The brightest star is the young girl who fills the sky with her glittering quill work, and the star twinkling at the very end of the handle is the youngest brother. The point of this myth, of course, is etiological. Um, we can see where the Big Dipper constellation comes from, but it also can show us how a cosmic tree might work. China has several cosmic trees in their myths, um, each, of one, it's each of which is considered a center, an axis mundi. The first one is called Qian Mu, it it's means the building tree, and it's situated at the center of the world, and it is the place where heaven and earth meet. Anne Burrell in Chinese mythology quotes a Chinese text describing that tree. The Qian Mu is in Tu Kuang. All the gods ascended and descended by it. It cast no shadow in the sun, and it made no echo when someone shouted. No doubt this is because it is the center of heaven and earth. It's described um, as having a purple trunk, green leaves, black blossoms, and yellow fruit. The trunk is bare for the first thousand feet, and when it reaches the sky, it can't penetrate the sky, so it spreads out its branches into nine giant coils. Below the earth, there are nine giant corresponding root tangles. The Chinese have other cosmic trees, and one interesting one is one called Fu Song, or the leaning mulberry tree, which is connected to a Chinese solar myth. The ancient Chinese calendar had uh, ten-day weeks, and one of their myths describes the birth of ten suns. So each, each sun will travel for one day, so that by the end of the week we have gone through all ten suns. And the mulberry tree is east, uh, next to a warm spring. Each day when the sun has finished its journey, it is washed and then hung out to dry on that mulberry tree. Uh, the one scheduled for the next day's trip either uh, sits on the top of that tree waiting for his turn or is carried to the top by a crow. In another myth, um, that same tree is the, uh, is the place for the 12 moons, one moon for each of the 12 months of the lunar calendar, which is also bathed in the same pool. The tree is described as growing on the summit of a mountain. It's 300 leagues tall. Its leaves are like those of a mustard plant. Like all cosmic trees, this one does the job of transferring energy from one world to the next. The Indians have cosmic trees too, but some of them are inverted uh, upside down so that the branches are spread over the earth and the roots are in the sky. One of these trees is described in the Upanishads, and Eliad, who thinks this is a really important concept, spends 14 pages on it. The tree itself, um, in Indian thought, is Brahman, is non-death. It's the essence of everything. And all the worlds that are rest in that tree. The symbolic value of an upside-down tree is that it symbolizes creation as a descending movement coming from heaven to earth. Here, the branches of that tree are the natural elements, air, fire, water, and earth. But the tree itself is Brahman, is the totality of reality. And as humans, we are involved in the life of the cosmos. They are part of the com cosmic tree and Brahman, and we are part of that cosmic tree and Brahman as well. The Bhagavad Gita actually talks about this tree. Arjuna, Arjuna is told that he has to cut that tree off at the roots because the goal of Hindu life is to withdraw from the cosmos and to withdraw from sensory life and to retreat inside oneself. It is Vishnu, of course, as Krishna, who's telling him this, and Vishnu says that's the only way that you can ever be free. There are lots and lots of other cosmic trees, but let me end this with a less abstract and more imminent tree. This is one from a Vietnamese folktale, and it's a really sweet story. Two brothers, Tan and Lang, um, they're not twins, but they, because they were born a year apart, but they look so much alike 
they wear the same kind of clothes, they cut their hair in the same way, that most people in their village can't tell them apart. Um, they're the pupils of the same schoolmaster, and that schoolmaster has a daughter named Tao. The three young people become friends, they grow up together, and Tao comes to be the only person in the village who can always tell the two brothers apart. Everybody's amazed because no one else can tell the difference between them. As they grow up, Tao realizes that Tan, the older brother, is in love with her. He's the older brother and by custom he should marry first, uh, so the parents arrange a marriage. The bride, as is traditional, moves into the husband's home, which means that Lang lives there too. And so Lang keeps saying that he wants to leave, he thinks he should move out, but, but Tan loves his brother and he won't hear of him leaving. And so the three live together in what turns out to be kind of a hothouse environment for a while. Tao comes to understand that Lang is in love with her too. Over time she comes to understand that this is happening, no matter how hard he tries to, tries to hide it. The relations come to a crisis one night when, when uh, after dark, Lang comes home before Tan does, and Tao, mistaking the one brother for the other, runs to embrace him. He pulls away, and she realizes her mistake, and that's the end of that. But the next morning, Lang says he's going to take the day off from work, and he leaves home, and he doesn't come back. After 10 days, Tan, who misses his brother, goes out in search of his brother, and then he doesn't come back. And by now, Tao is deeply concerned for both her husband and her brother-in-law, and so she goes out in search of both of them. She travels, the story says, until her sandals are shreds, and she protects her bleeding feet with pieces of cloth that she tears from her clothing. And then one night, on the night of a great storm, she comes to a farmer's hut by the river, and she begs for shelter. The farmer and his wife feed her, and they tell her that a while back, a young man matching the description of either brother came to the riverbank and sat during a storm like the one they're having tonight, sat there all night. The farmer tried to invite the young man in, but the young man refused. The farmer took a jacket down so that he at least could protect himself from the rain. In the morning, the farmer finds only a great white rock that hadn't been there before. There was no sign of the young man who seems to have disappeared. Ten days later, Another young man came by, and he stopped and asked whether another young man had come by here. They tell him what had happened, and then he rushes out into another storm to spend the night clutching that white rock by the riverbank. By morning, that young man is gone too, but now there's a new tree growing by the rock. Tao assures them that she'll stay indoors in the middle of this storm, but in the middle of the night, she goes down to the rock and tree, she kneels by the rock, she puts her arms around the tree and weeps. And in the morning, the guest is gone, she's gone, but at the riverbank now there's a new green ivy which is wound around the tree, its roots underneath the rock. Sometime later, the king and his retinue pass by and they notice the white rock, the tree, and the vine, and they stop to rest beside them. By now there's a shrine here too. Um, an attendant who knows the story tells it to the king and says that the shrine was built by the families of these young people and the local people now come and burn incense to the memory of Tan and Lang and Tao. The king asks for some fruit from that tree. He's, it's a tree that he's never, kind of tree he's never seen before and he cuts it into small bits and he chews on it. It isn't sweet but it is refreshing and then he takes a leaf from the vine wrapped around the tree and he adds that to the quid and it makes it a little better. It also turns his saliva red. He adds a scraping from the rock, and that makes it even better, and it turns his lips red this time. Now all the king's attendants try it, and the king decrees that from now on, that fruit, leaf, and rock will become the symbol of an offering of a marriage proposal, and it will also become the, sy the symbol of a Vietnamese wedding. It's a symbol of love and fidelity, and it's in honor of those three young people. The story, as we understand, is the story, it's an ideological story of how chewing betel nut wrapped in a leaf with a sliver of quicklime began among the Vietnamese. So it is an ideological myth. Um, betel nut, as I understand, is not used quite so much as it used to be, but it used to have a widespread distribution, especially in, in, across Asia and the South Pacific Islands in places like India and Vietnam and Sri Lanka and Indonesia and the Philippines and the Marianas and American Samoa and Bangladesh. In, in virtually all of these places, the chew is, is a crushed beetle seed 
a pinch of quicklime is added, maybe a hint of cardamom or nutmeg, and then it's wrapped in a leaf from the betel tree. It provides a feeling of well-being, it reduces hunger, it seems to provide energy, and for many years it was the traditional gift which began a courtship, and also a traditional marriage gift. Here that practice is accounted for by the king's recognition of the love and fidelity inscribed in the story and in the rock and tree and vine and shrine, and here we see a sacred site in the making. Eliad says that there's much more to the story than this. The combination, he says, of goddess, tree, water, and rock occurs throughout world mythology from as far back as the pre-Aryan cultures of Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro, where a naked goddess is often pictured between two trees. When we add water to that, we get a symbol of life and fertility and regeneration, regeneration as we do, say, in the Genesis story of Eve before the fall standing by the tree of life in a place where the four great rivers of the world begin. The, the same associations occur in Egyptian stories of Hathor, in Mesopotamian stories of Siduri, that goddess at the edge of the ocean of death whom Gilgamesh stops to visit on his way to see Utnapishtim. Tau, of course, isn't literally a goddess in this story, but iconographically, the symbols here make this another center of the world. A rock is always a kind of Bethel, marking off a sacred zone, which most often contains a cosmic tree. Here, these are put together in a story that on the surface explains a Vietnamese custom, and it also promotes marital fidelity, but on, a, on deeper levels reminds us of what myths can tell us about the ways that we apprehend the reality of the world around us. Throughout this course, particularly in the last three lectures, our line between religion and myth has gotten fuzzy. Um, so let me go back and remind you of what we said in that very first lecture about the differences between them. There are lots of ways of defining the differences. One way that has worked for our purposes in this course it is, is that a religious story is one that we believe to be true, historically or literally, while a myth is a story that violates our sense of the ways the laws of nature and the cosmos work, so whatever kind of truth it contains has to be metaphorical or allegorical. For example, in this course we've had a series of miraculous births. Athena is born from the head of Zeus. Jesus is conceived on a virgin by God as the Holy Spirit. Buddha is conceived in his mother's dream of a white elephant, and Mwindo, we remember, is born from his mother's middle finger. All of these stories violate our sense of the laws of conception and birth, and so how we treat the story depends on whether we're inside the story or outside it. That is, we either believe it in some way or we don't, so that if we don't believe it, common sense tells us it couldn't have happened that way. Even this, however, is not, ex and ex not exactly precise because there are many people within religious traditions who believe the stories in their traditions contain only some kind of metaphoric truth. I know quite a few practicing Jews and Christians who are, who are devout and good uh, Jews or Christians, but who have personal doubts about the Genesis account of creation or the parting of the Red Sea or the virgin birth or even the resurrection. Still, for people inside a religious tradition, there's a kind of truth in these stories that's different from the truth in the stories in other people's religions. Differences we designate by calling their stories myths. Over the last 36 lectures, we've been trying to understand what kinds of truth those myths contain and how we can get at them. I think we've discovered it along the way that there are at least four different major ways in which we can understand the truth of myth. The first one is what Joseph Campbell calls the mystical or the metaphysical. This kind of truth awakes us to the mystery of being alive in the universe. We're here in this place and time, and we need to believe that the place and our own existence is intentional, is part of some plan, even if the scope and purpose of that plan eludes us. Creation myths do this for us. The second way in which we understand the truth of myth can be, we can call cosmological. That is, every myth gives us a picture of the universe in keeping with the best science of the time, explaining the way the universe works in cosmological terms. Campbell and other mythographers have frequently criticized 
traditional religions for failing to incorporate modern scientific worldviews into their myths. Usually when we say that a story is timeless, we mean really unchanging and we commit ourselves to worldviews of earlier times, forgetting that myths are explanations for us here and now, not where we were before the theory of evolution or before carbon dating or before geological discoveries. Myths are always our way of explaining the universe to ourselves, so that myths always have to be growing and developing. They have to be changing as our understanding of, the, of nature and the cosmos change. The third way in which we can understand uh, the truth of myths is what we might call sociological. And these are myths which, which explain the existing social order and how we as individuals relate to the group. We've had a lot of examples of these throughout this course. In the one Genesis account, we remember that Eve was created from Adam's rib, and because of that, and because she fell first and then tempted Adam, women are, according to this version of the story, always going to be subordinate to men. We've also seen the story when in the Chinese myth, Nu Kua creates the first humans. She does so by molding them with her hands being very careful, making each one carefully. These turn out, according to Chinese reading of this, these turn out to be the ancestors of aristocrats. Later she gets bored with the slowness of this process and then simply drags a rope through the mud and then as pieces of mud fly off from this rope, other humans are created via a kind of mass production. They are of course the ancestors of commoners and that myth explains why some people own and control everything and why other people own and control nothing. In Indonesia, there's a myth about a huge vagina that appears on the earth and people pull themselves out by creepers. The ones who emerge first become the ruling class and those who come later become the subjects. Um, again, a, a mythical explanation for social classes, and it's been suggested even a mythical explanation for the law of primogeniture. And in, in myths like the ones that we looked at about the, where the cosmos is created out of the body of a dead god or giants, one's social and economic status really depends on which part of the body you came from. If you came from the chest or arms, you're probably going to be rulers or warriors. Um, if you came from the legs and feet, you're going to be likely turn out to be a worker. Um, so that in all of these ways we can see social values built into um, these myths. Eliad says that every human institution was originally understood as a gift of the gods. The initiation dreamtime rituals in Australia, the Kachina festivals among the Hopi, and in Sumeria, ironworking and agriculture and kingship, and the art of sex are all gifts of the gods. Everything that is and the way it's structured is therefore a gift of the gods and tells us the way things are and the ways that they should be. Where we are and the way we do things in these kinds of myths comes from the source of all reality and the myths remind us of that and tell us that the way things have been set up are ways that we have to maintain for ourselves. Finally, as we've seen across this course, the fourth way of reading myths, in our own time we've learned to read them psychologically. The goal of this kind of, of mythical truth is that it can, it can lead us as individuals toward kind of emotional and intellectual strength, toward health, toward a kind of internal harmony that allows us to be ourselves and still allows us to integrate with a group. Cultures and institutions tend to ossify until they become rigid and sterile and no longer give an individual a chance to be him or herself. So in hero myths, the individual has to heed a call from his own unconscious. He has to set out on a quest that challenges the assumptions of the group. And we have seen how heroes like Gilgamesh and King Arthur and Jason and Moindo and Demeter and Hester Prynne and Psyche set off on this kind of journey and return with boons that strengthen and revitalize the community as well as allowing these people to achieve an inner integrity themselves. Tricksters do the same thing as we've seen in less conventional ways. They bring dirt in from outside the cultural fences and they force those of us inside to adapt to and accommodate some new and disturbing elements that they bring in with them. We remember the story of Susa Noo, 
who disrupts a heavenly harvest festival by bringing a lot of dirt into it. But in the process, he also manages to bring agriculture to the human world and thus makes the world better than it was before. The Winnebago trickster plays havoc with people's taboos, but he provides new plants for humans. He teaches the values of resourcefulness and reflexibility. Um, Eshu and Legba violate their people's most sacred rules, but at the same time they provide the divine gift of divination, which allows people to find out what the gods have planned for their lives. In psychological terms, the source for human creativity is the unconscious, and we have to journey into it, and bat the battles we fight there are battles that we fight with our own nursery monsters, and those kinds of battles fought where they are fought are the secret to both individual growth and to community renewal. Myths also function for us on a variety of other levels in everyday life. Myths are, as we have said often enough throughout this course, are cultural dreams. They're dreams of all the individuals who make up a culture. And over and over again, we return to those dreams to make sense of who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. We all have myths that we live by, whether we know it or not. Each family has its myths, which get retold every time a family gets together or gathers for a funeral. My father had a huge repertoire of stories he told about me from the time that I was too young to remember. I, so I didn't know whether they were accurate or, accurate, accurate or not. And, but it, whenever I would bring a new friend or a new girlfriend home, he would drag these stories out and retell them. Again, as I said, I didn't know whether they were true or not. But over the years, I did notice that they kept on getting better the more often he told them. They had more detail in them. They had more concern for motiv motivation. They had better punchlines. John Foles in The French Lieutenant's Woman, and he's in, at one with a lot of existentialists who would say the same thing, say that we all do this. We all make up our own biographies as we go along. My father helped me create the myths of my own life by telling me these stories, and I passed them on to my daughter, even though I still don't know whether they're true or not. But by now they have become so much a part of my sense of who I am that I consider them to contain a kind of truth a truth about the way my dad saw me, some things about myself that I was too young to remember, and perhaps something about the relationship between my dad and I that is not, may not be literally true, but contains a lot of truth that you can't get at any other way. Families, when we get together, we all tell each other stories which we recognize is not literally true, but which contain some truths about family and relationships that we can't achieve with a literal account. We also have myths that we share with members of our high school or college classes, and we retell them at reunions. And we also, I notice, as with my dad, we tell them with increasing convictions as we get older. And the stories get better as we retell them. No one, by the time a story gets really developed, no one was ever that stupid or that naive or that drunk or that embarrassed. But the stories that we tell, even if they're not quite literally true, contain some truths about us as family members or as members of the class of 1965 or the people who work together at that same IBM office that no literal account could match. And one thing that makes these myths of the world so profound is that we use them to structure and create the myths that we write for ourselves. We're all mythical in this kind of way. As we create stories about ourselves, our families, our classmates, our coworkers, our friends, we structure those stories in patterns that were created by our ancestors, ways that make sense of why we're here and what we're supposed to be doing, what it's all about, and how we can manage to live healthy lives as individuals, coming to terms with our own unconscious and fighting the demons that live there and at the same time, finding out how as individuals to relate to the larger communities of which we're a part. Coming to terms also with our sense of our own contingency, our limitations, our that we recognize ourselves as fragments of some primal oneness. And at the same time, finding meaning in those larger communities, learning things that work for all of us, and learning how to hear the trickster when he tells us we're getting too stuffy, too set in our ways, asking, us to, asking him to bring in some dirt from outside the village walls that will allow us to grow and develop and learn and change. 
So myths, whether they are of the urban sort about alligators in sewers, or individual ones that set us off on quests for our own golden fleece to become heroes in a world that still needs heroes, communal ones that remind us that every civilized skill we have is a gift, or cosmogonic ones that remind us that every breath is a moment that we tear away from the entropy that's always the alternative to this universe. All of these kinds of myths gives us, give us the structures by which we live, and we use them to make up the myths of our own. This is perhaps one of the greatest gifts that we have from our ancestors, and it's a gift not to be taken lightly. We hope you have enjoyed these lectures from our Great Courses series. Our courses are now available to order online. Visit our website at www.teach12.com or call our customer care representatives at 1-800-TEACH-12. That's 1-800-TEACH-12. Thank you very much.